please stand for the doxology. We praise you because you are our great God. We praise you, dear Father, because you are immortal and you have died for us. And because of your great love, we thank you, dear Father, that we can worship you each Sabbath as we look forward to your soon coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's a great day to praise God today. Let's remain standing with the two hymns of praise.
morning and a happy Sabbath, everyone. I believe many of us are aware of the five love languages made you know, well known by New York uh, Times bestseller book by Dr. Gary Chapman. And the five love languages, if we can recap, is words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. As we can see, one of the love language is receiving gifts. And if a person whose love language is this, when he receives a gift, he or she feels more love. And gift giving is normal part of our lives, right? We give gifts on every occasion, on any occasion on special occasions or even no occasion, just, be, just because gifts. And gifts come in, in various forms. And for the Chinese especially, gift giving comes in the form of money. It is always customary for us to give the red packet or ang pao's, not only on Chinese New Year, but we give them to weddings, birthdays, and other special significant occasions. We also set aside special angpaos for our parents, our seniors in the family, and our children during Chinese New Year. Now the amount given in these red packets varies but it is always more when we give to one that is very close to us. Then there are also monetary gifts that our grown-up, our young adults will give to their parents when they start working. Now perhaps the parents actually have no need for this um, monetary gifts because they may be financially able, but the gesture from the children shows the love and filial piety on the children's part. Now, likewise, our Heavenly Father has no need for our money. The whole universe is His. He is super rich. He is almighty and all-powerful with limitless resources. However, our gifts to him through our tithes and offerings shows our love, devotion, and worship to him. And every time we give, we express our love, devotion, and obedience to God. Lest we forget and our love for God grows cold, giving is a reminder of our love relationship thanksgiving, an act of worship to God. In 2 Corinthians 9, 11, 20, 12, it says, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for blessing us and for giving us your love. And for this, we are able to provide the means to share your love with others. Please accept our gifts as a token of our love, devotion, and worship to you. Bless our gifts that they will be used effectively for ministries that will impact others to come to know you and with that, we'll expand your kingdom. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. I invite every one of you to please come forward and place our love, offerings, and gifts into the box in front of the church.
Let's quieten our heart as we prepare for the prayer and we will sing the hymn of prayer. I'd like to invite the congregation to settle our hearts and minds and to lay aside all distractions as we kneel before the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, dear loving Heavenly Father, we come before your throne this morning with abundant joy and thanksgiving joy for the opportunity of coming before you to worship in your sanctuary on your holy day and thanksgiving for the many blessings we have received this week blessings of life of health of shelter of food of means and of, for the opportunity for meaningful activities in our lives we thank you for being interested in each one of us and our eternal well-being, to want to come to be with us this morning. And at this time, we would like to present to you our petitions for to seek your love, your grace, and your mercy. We ask, O oh Lord, for humble spirit to worship, a true confession, and complete repentance led by the Holy Spirit. Help us to daily walk a little closer to the example that Christ has set for us. We pray also for our members who may be suffering under trials and temptations, whether secular or spiritual. We pray that you will guide them and heal them if there's a need for healing. We pray for our parents and their young ones that, may be, that they may be wise to know how to lead their children to a closer walk with you. We pray for our young adults who are seeking direction in their lives. And we pray for our seniors that their faith may grow ever stronger as they traverse through their twilight years. We pray also, Father, for our speaker, Pastor Kion that he may be faithful in bringing a word from your throne to each one of us, that we may leave this place inspired and committed to wanting to live a life that will glorify your name. For all this, we ask in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.
our scripture reading this morning, let us turn to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 15. <coughs> but the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine, besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. May God bless the reading of his word. Good morning once again. Happy Sabbath, everyone. This quarter, as we looking at the continual idea of the lessons of leadership from the book of Nehemiah, uh, last week we, of course, covered about the different oppression of the people. And today we come to the idea of the fear of God, or rather, actually, the theme is about leaders' idealized influence. So they will do something in the hope that of their influence, others will follow. When we tend to think of the fear of God, we tend to think of something scary. Yeah? I think traditionally some people will think of lightning, thunder, an angry God. People who may think of God of the Old Testament, some people think, ah, so scary, you know, I want the loving God that is embracing me in his arms. Eh? So oftentimes we may have that idea or a fear of God, of something scary, something that we don't like. But the fact of the matter is the gospel is balanced, right? There needs to be both the idea of the love, which includes fear, but fear not being in an unhealthy sense that, uh, that you fear and therefore you only follow God because you're afraid to die or you're afraid to go to hell. Not in that sense, right? But fear, as we look at the word uh, in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible in Nehemiah 5, when it talks about the word, it talks about year or, which is the idea of an awesome or Thing, a fear of the respect, the reverence, the piety. Sometimes we ask ourselves, right, do we have the fear of God? Right? When we come perhaps to the church or perhaps when we come to Sabbath, do we treat God with that reverence, that respect, that piety? Sometimes I will be tempted to say that even myself included, oftentimes we may not have done so. Right? Many times we might take it a little bit casually. Ah, Sabbath, okay, every week the same thing. When we come to church, we may not really think about the fact that God's presence is here. We may just come here, ah, just normal, right? But when we also go about our daily activities, the idea of the fear of God, that we may not really consider that sometimes, even at the back of our minds. We may just live life as it is, right? Whatever work we have to do, we do. Whatever purpose we have to meet, we just meet. But Nehemiah himself had the fear of God at the back of his mind. And I think that characterizes something different uh, from that of you and I, or that of the usual Jews. Because sometimes we may just live life normally, we may not think about it, or our actions sometimes may not truly reflect it. And I think that's why we are like taking a look at it today, because perhaps it's something we need to consider. If you turn with me to the Bibles, we will be using our Bibles today, and uh, not so much the PowerPoint. If you turn for me in Nehemiah chapter 5, and we look together in Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 14 to 19, would be uh, our, left, our verses for study this morning. In Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 14, it says, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, neither Neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. Sure, first, we look at the idea of Nehemiah 3 and 4, focus on rebuilding the wall. Now the wall was rebuilt complete, they moved to Nehemiah 5 to 7, looking on the people. And the people faced challenges internally, which we are looking at first in Nehemiah 5. Last week, we dealt with the oppression of the people, where they were oppressed, they were sold as slaves, even by their own people, they received, they had tax, they had, couldn't pay back their interest because their lands, their sons and daughters, their olive groves, all were taken away 
and Nehemiah confronted them to return it all to the people, which the leaders did. But today we will look on the other side. So there was them, him confronting the leaders. Today we will look at the other side, which is Nehemiah himself. How about him? What were his actions amidst this time? Nehemiah at that time uh, was there for that 12 years. It was around the period of uh, BC 433 uh, onwards for the next 12 years. So it's about now 2,400 over years ago. Yeah, quite a long time. And during that time, of course, it was common to have servants, even slaves. And as he dealt with that time, the governors, they would get the taxes from the people. Now, if you think about it, in life, they say there's few things very sure in life, right? There is death, taxes, and something else you want to add in, right? To think to not to have paid taxes is unimaginable, right? In today's society or any point of society in Earth's history. But the taxes itself was used to help to fund the governor, in this case Nehemiah, as well as the people with him. Uh, there were, they are mentioned later, they have 150 people, but day by day they will have perhaps seven to 800 people that will eat every day, they will have their salaries covered, and all the different expenses in the courts was covered by the people. But, and that produced heavy burdens. So if we look at here, even though there was food, allotted to them, there was the governor's provisions, Nehemiah chose not to take the governor's provisions. Think about it. Something that's provided for free, Nehemiah chose not to take it. Something that he had to, that they had to provide for the seven or eight hundred people within his midst, including the 150 mentioned, Nehemiah chose not to take the taxes from the government indirectly therefore not taxing the people so that he would not have to burden the people because he saw them suffering. Wow, I think this is something we can only imagine, something we can only wish for. Oh, wow, why I got such thing, right? But it did happen, right, in the time of Nehemiah. And of course, how did he fund it? Well, he fund it on his own personal expense. He chose his own personal sacrifice. He chose to fund it himself. Imagine, right? Everything provided for free. There is the standard status quo. Take from the taxes from the people to fund the running of the courts of the hundreds of people under him, their salaries, their day-to-day -day food and everything. Instead of taking that from the king's tax, which is the very norm and everyone expects that, Nehemiah chooses to fund everything himself, his personal sacrifice. Wow. I think that is something he chose to do, and he mentions clearly the reason why. We took a look at it in verse 15, which was read by Elder Joachim earlier. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine, besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. There were former governors of Judah uh, who did the very normal thing. And in spite of all the people last week we were sharing, the people, the common people who were slaves, they, had, they were crying out, their sons and daughters were slaves, their land had to, had to be taken, their olive groves had been taken just to pay the interest and the tax that they could never pay for their entire life. And even though they were supposed to help the poor every three years, they're supposed to take a tithe from the land, help the poor, all the governors, perhaps, perhaps in the past, may have just conveniently ignored it. Just look at the facts and figures says, you owe this, you pay this, that is your problem to settle, right? That is a normal way of looking at things. But Nehemiah chose not to just look at what is the normal things, There's not to look at what he deserves, which is to take the tax from the people, but he looks at what he can go beyond and what God has called him to do because of the fear of God. Because of the fear of God, Nehemiah could go the extra mile. He could do something that was perhaps unheard of. He could do something that was unprecedented. Because he had the fear of God, he did something. He sacrificed. He went out of the way because he cared for the people and their suffering. 
Nehemiah chose not to take their land. If we read here, they, the other governors in the past, they took from them bread and wine, and not there was also the 40 shekels of silver that was the tax. So not only he don't take tax, he also don't take their food. He basically don't take anything to help them along. And then, of course, last week we learned he helped them to cancel their debts, make sure to return their land so that they can get back to life in normalcy. Because of the fear of God, Nehemiah went far and beyond his call of duty, right? His duty perhaps was just to rebuild the wall, finish, he could have just gone back to Persia and live his comfortable life as the cupbearer, as the Persian king's cupbearer. He could have done that. But he chose to stay on, at least here 12 years and later on a second term for an uh, unspecified amount of time. But he chose to stay there with his people, not just being there, comfortably receiving tax, but he chose to take a step forth, letting, helping the people. The idea here in the social responsibility, uh, if we look at it, we will take a look in uh, more in verse 17. Indeed, uh, let's look at verse 16. Indeed, I also continued the work on this wall, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work. So they did not take the opportunity because the people didn't have money to take all their land and then later tax them back, but rather they did not touch it. Let the people have their land. Let the people come back to their lives. Verse 17, And at my table were 150 Jews and rulers, besides those who came to us from the nations around us. If we look at history, uh, it says here, A text found at Nimrud has Ashur Nasapal to feeding 69,574 guests at a banquet for 10 days. Well, imagine feeding about 70,000 guests at a banquet where they eat lavishly for 10 days. Normally, uh, kings when they came or rulers when they came, they would always hold lavish banquets. And when Solomon also himself dedicated the temple, he had sacrificed 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats and had a great festival for the assembly for 14 days. So we look at the general banquet, there's thousands and thousands of people to be fed. But Nehemiah did not choose to put this on the people. He did not choose to have all these lavish things so much, but he took care of it from his own pocket, imagine. As I mentioned just now, daily there will be generally 600 to 800 persons based on the historical uh, idea. Uh, the 150 were his direct rulers that were under him. And he was expected to cover everything. Yeah? The business expense, the salary, the food, and all these things were covered by him. They, of course, there in the next verse, if you look at verse 18, there were prepared daily were one ox and six choice sheep and also fowl or were prepared for me. And once every 10 days in abundance, all kinds of that. Yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provisions because the bondage was heavy on these people. Nehemiah had every right to do so, but he chose not to because of the heavy burdens of the people. Because he feared the God, he had a fear of God. So he chose to do what God had convicted him to do. At the end, he says, remember me, remember me, my God, for good, according to all I have done for these people. Nehemiah remembered the Lord, he feared the Lord. And likewise, he wanted God to remember him for what he had done. That God would not forget him, but he will remember him, and of course later, indirectly, his people, the children of Israel. Nehemiah here was chosen. He was chosen for a special purpose, to rebuild the wall. He was chosen because he was willing to cooperate with God as the one of a restorer. He not only restored the walls, he also restored the relationships of the people. He restored the, the broken system where the people who were poor, were slaves forever, couldn't get out of the system. He restored them together as one brethren. He restored the broken system and there, likewise, because he was looking at God who restores him, because he was looking at God's covenant of love and grace to him, because he had experienced the love and grace of God, he likewise took the step. He feared the Lord and that's why he extended that love and grace to others. Today as we look at it, the idea is that sometimes we look at ourselves and 
here in Prophets and Kings, page 651, he says, He who truly fears God would rather toil day and night and eat the bread of poverty than to indulge the passion for gain that oppresses the widow and fatherless or turns the stranger from his right. It reminds us that, yes, we may have our rights. Yes, it's very easy to say, don't think about the social dynamics and situation. Just do what is the correct thing to do, or rather not the right thing, but whatever I deserve, everything I should take. But Nehemiah shows us something different. We don't just look at everything I deserve, but what does God call me to do as I fear him? Perhaps to go beyond what I deserve, to go to what? I can give to others. If we look at what we deserve, Jesus never deserved to die, right? He could just stay ha happily in heaven. If we look at what we deserve, we can say, ah, I don't deserve to suffer and all these things. But because Nehemiah experienced the salvation of Jesus, do we also likewise experience it that we want to also fear the Lord and let him govern our actions. This morning, I want to, to look at us uh, and uh, ask a few questions and invite you to scan the QR code. Because as I mentioned, the idea of leadership uh, has the idea, idealized influence. In Nehemiah's case, there was a problem. And that problem was the social oppression, the oppression of the people. And Nehemiah's solution was to add personal sacrifice to pay whatever was needed, right? The taxes, the food, he, everything sacrificed and take care of it so that the burdens will not be heavier on the people. Likewise, our vision was also formed because of the different circumstances surrounding it. Uh, first, I share our vision. Uh, if you, your yes and no will be before I say what is the vision, it's okay if it's no. I, I'm quite sure a lot of us don't know also. So anyway, the vision of our church I shared, actually if you read your bulletin, uh, it's at the top every week. It's prayerful, loving community. Uh, we shared that, of course, uh, last year, and we may not repeat it, repeated it often enough, which is why we are repeating today and uh, sharing, because we want to idealize the influence that we indeed can be that prayerful, loving community. And uh, let's take a look together. Uh, as we look at the answer, you may answer yes or no. And while you answer, I'd like to uh, head to the next question first, then we will discuss it. Knowing that our church vision is prayerful, loving community, do you think our church is a prayerful, loving community? So uh, five being strongly agree and one being strongly disagree, where will you place our church on that scale of first line, prayerful, second, loving, and third, community? Yeah, so where will we place ourselves on that prayerful, loving, continuity, continuum? So as we answer, give me just half a minute as I grab my laptop to see the results. Yeah, so please scan the QR code, answer the two questions, and uh, let's see the results. Okay, are you able to answer it? Yeah, I think I switch it now. While we take a look, um, the first one, okay, let's see the second is still coming in. The first one first, let me see. Out of those who answered, 31 people said yes, they knew our vision, and 14 people said no, they didn't know our vision. Yep, I think what is the number uh, in terms of percent? Let's use our calculator to get a feeling. That's about 69%, so about two-thirds know that the vision and one-third doesn't. So I think the first step, of course, to get there is first we need to know, right? If we don't know how to get there. So I think that's the first step. And uh, the second one, I will let us continue to answer first as I discuss a bit about uh, where they came from. Yeah. If you remember, uh, our church, uh, about a few years ago, I asked some of us, uh, I received certain questions, and I thought to myself, is our church really like that? 
there was, uh, I, I shared this once before, there was a pastor who came one day preaching, I think it was back in 2019, there about, and after he preached, he re- was at the back, and then after he went home, he told me, uh, Pastor Cheryl, I think your church is very cold, you know. I was standing at the back, and very few people came to shake my hand, he said. And I thought to myself, yeah, I, I think he's maybe right. And there was another visitor as well who came. This is back a couple of years ago. Huh? Just remember, this is already about five years ago. A visitor who came about 2020. And... He came for two, three weeks, and he came to me and he said, Pastor, I've been here for months, and only the same two, three people have greeted me. No one else, everyone treats me as if I'm invisible. And I thought to myself, oh dear, is our church really cool? I said, I think perhaps that might be the case, I thought. And then I started to ask myself, would I dare to bring my friend to the church? Would I feel that my friend would be happy to be here, feel welcome? And after consideration, I thought to myself, no, probably not. And I started to ask around a few uh, board members and youths, and they all gave the same answer. They said, no, we were not there to do so, because we feel it's also the same way as you feel, a little too cold, our friends may not survive. I said, Ah, if the pastor feels so, our church board members feel so, our youth feel so, there is no hope. We have to change something, right? If not, our church will never grow, right? It's because it's just too cold. And that's where, the, as I was praying, the idea, the vision was birthed of a prayerful, loving community. Because after all, we first, I believe that no revival happens without prayer, right? So that's the, the basis. And a loving community, a loving church, because in John, it says, right, by this, all men shall know you, my disciples, if you love one another. And that idea struck me strongly because I felt if definitely when I heard sermons, stories, they said, oh, the church was saying that we have all these doctrines, you know, Sabbath, cannot eat this, cannot do that. Are you sure you want to join us? Then the person said, yeah, of course I want to join you because I see Jesus in your church, because your church is loving. And that church was a church that had reached out to the community, was praying in the mornings. And I look at that, I say, wow, we will get there someday by God's grace. And that's where we start on that journey, if I may share. And uh, before I share further, let's take a look a bit at the results. Uh, We have prayerful out of five, 3.4. So that's about 68%. It's a journey. uh. If we are all five, you must remember, then our vision is complete. We can always change. So we are still on this journey, you must remember. Loving, uh, three out of five. So that is 60%, okay? And community, that is 2.8. So that is uh, 56%. Uh, So just a bit above 50%, but we have a long way to go, yeah? But nevertheless, I would like to encourage us, probably we had done this surveys ago, maybe the answer will be around two out of five, I think. At least that's how I feel, huh? So we are growing, we are going on this journey. We have only started this vision for the last one and a half to two years. It, it takes time, probably in another five years, we may be there, and uh, maybe we'll have another vision when that time comes. But what I would like to share in terms of that idea of a prayerful, loving community is that our church, at least today, in the last one year, especially in the last half a year, in the last one year, many visitors who have come have started to come and say the opposite. Thank God for that and thank you for all members who have warmly welcomed our visitors as well and friends. They started to say, Pastor Chen Rong, wow, your church is so warm. They compare to their countries back in whichever country they come from. They say, I've never seen more than 10 people come and talk to me. Some even said 20 people come and talk to me. They say, I've, from the moment I step in to the moment I leave, people are just so warm and friendly. And I thought that it was beautiful because looking at where we've come from, uh, it is something that was heartwarming indeed. Just a few weeks ago, we had some visitors from Solomon's Islands, and they texted me after leaving. And they said that, Pastor, we are so happy to be here. You indeed have a warm church, and you have God's people in your church. So, wow, praise God, right? We do have a transformation of uh, uh, statements, right? From your church is very cold, nobody cares, to now everyone says your church is very warm, and you have God's people in your church. 
That is how people may see, right, of that loving community that we may show. The idea of community, if I may add, uh, is that if you remember, uh, we had the Haitians who were uh, here in church. How many of us remember the Haitians who were us in church last year? Okay, good, a couple of hands. They were, the, were also part of reaching out to community. Uh, this is one in terms of outreach and others in our midst. We start with this. They came to church and they were in need. And they were running away from their political and difficult situation in their country. And as today, our church looked to help them. And I realized that our church, though we had a welfare fund for members, we had no funds to help non-members. And we were thinking, so what shall we do, right? We have always left it to the private people to donate. And uh, that's all fine and good. But from a church point of view, we didn't have anything at that time to help. And that's when the board out of compassion decided to start the community charity fund, right? And we appeal and you donated thousands of dollars. And there from then on, they managed to go safely to Taiwan. And today, or rather I spoke to them a few months ago, they're happily working in Taiwan, no longer in a desperate need. And they were always said, Pastor, we are so thankful of what Balestia Church has done for us. Sometimes there may be things that don't exist within the current scope of things, right? You say, there is no such policy, there is no such budget, we cannot help. That will be the easiest answer, right? But we look at what is God calling us to do? Because of the fear of the Lord, we cannot leave others stranded just there, right? We are called to do something to help. And thankfully, the board agreed. And the church members, of course, all of us supported to help others. We also have the uh, people we have been reaching out to, if I may share, uh, in the care corner as well. We have been visiting the seniors and uh, especially, if I may share, Sister Corina and Sister Jesse have been visiting one senior. And because of the love that they have been showing to them, the senior came and came here to church a few times and was blessed and said, wow, well, I'm so happy to be a warm community. And they even gave offerings bigger than the amount that many of us normally give. And I thought it was very interesting because of the loving community that touched the hearts of people, they want to come. They want to experience the worship. They want to experience the fellowship. They want to experience that loving community because of that love. Today, we invite ourselves, of course, not to forget prayerful, our church has been on that journey. Uh, we have, since the 10 days of prayer uh, a year over ago, a group came forth and started to say we want to pray on the mornings. They came on Thursday mornings, prayed together, and because of that, we started to see many others who joined in prayer. We start to see many people walking in, right? Visitors walking in, coming to our church like never before, right? I remember Pastor Chan said, wow, God is blessing your ministry. We have never seen in my entire ministry here so many visitors in our church. There is the power in prayer and the power in being a loving community. And today, if we are not yet knowing this or not yet practicing in some form, I invite us, because we fear the Lord, that we may also choose to be more prayerful and a loving community. That is what I like to invite us uh, to do so. We have started to see the fruits of it, and I invite us to continue in that direction. Whatever that God has called you to do, sometimes it may be a bit of a sacrifice, but because you love the Lord and you fear the Lord, may you do so and help our church to become a prayerful, loving community that God has called us to be. How many of us would like to join me in this journey as we will be a prayerful, loving community together with the church all together? Thank you for your hands. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning as you reminded us of how Nehemiah, how he has sacrificed in order that to answer your call because of his fear of you. Lord, may we likewise love you and fear you and be able to be a prayerful, loving community that you have called us to be. In our weaknesses, be our strength. May your grace supply our every need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
as we contemplate upon the message, let's all stand for the hymn of benediction. the love of the Father be with us and as Jesus who prayed for us may we likewise pray for one another and for others may the Holy Fellowship of the Holy Spirit strengthen us as we desire to be a prayerful loving community in Jesus name we pray Amen Have a blessed Sabbath.